Hi, I'm Chris Tucker, Chairman of the American Geographical Society. As we were planning Geography 2050, my colleague Banning Garrett mentioned that today's guest was releasing a new book this fall. When he mentioned the topic and the title, I just knew that I wanted to recruit him to give a book talk as part of the symposium. And as luck would have it, we succeeded. Kim Stanley Robinson, the acclaimed science fiction author known for his books, The Mars Trilogy, Green Earth, 2312, New York 2140, and so many more, has just released his new book entitled The Ministry of the Future. It's a provocative story of catastrophe in, uh, inducing a fundamentally new global institution for proactively addressing the scourge of climate change, protecting and regenerating the biosphere so that future generations of humans and the plants and animals that we depend on can survive. Of course, you can't talk about climate change without talking about the future of the oceans. So we're excited to talk with Stan today to learn about his book and about what the Ministry of the Future teaches us about the future of the world ocean. Stan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. I'm happy to be with you. And congratulations on the new book. How many is this for you? I don't really know. Um, <laughs> maybe 20. Wow. Okay. Uh, something, something like that. It gives us all life goals to aspire to. We appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that's a, a sane goal, but that's okay. <laughs> so, so to all the potential readers uh, listening in today, without providing too much in the way of spoilers, how would you describe your book, its plot, and the urgency of the time frame that you set it in? Um, I wanted to do a science fiction novel that described the next 30 years or so um, in a way that readers could believe that it could happen that way. And uh, 30 year, at the end of it, see a human civilization that had come to grips with climate change and was dealing with it uh, as well as one could believe in. So this was a global novel and, uh, uh, and, and covering really three decades. Well, the novel isn't very well uh, equipped. The normally structured novel isn't very well equipped to deal with that kind of a scenario. But the science fiction novel has its tricks, and so does the regular novel being a very capacious form. So I, I uh, structured it by postulating the ministry for the future and setting it in Zurich so that I had an anchor of characters and uh, place. And from there, ranged really widely using a whole uh, variety of literary forms like the eyewitness account, the riddle, the prose poem, the meeting notes, uh, that kind of thing. And, um, that's pretty much the book. It's a, a melange, and I thought that because the topic is kind of grim, dire, we are in an in a, um, emergency situation right now in our relationship to the biosphere, and it's scary. And so uh, novels are still uh, art form, and art has to do with pleasure, entertainment, for for fun and so with this topic being what it is the fun for me came out of the uh, variety of forms out of the uh, there's 106 chapters when you start a chapter you don't know what kind of uh, narrative you're going to be reading it might not be narrative at all you don't know what kind of text you're going to be reading and so the game of the novel is this um, choreographed or, or quilting of uh, together of different forms no, I certainly appreciated that as a reader. Uh, you know, sometimes you sit there and go, well, wait a minute, there's 106 chapters. I'm going to have to work through each one. But when each one's kind of a little surprise that you open up as a package, it, 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 it makes it kind of a fun page turner for sure. Um, so Ministry of the Future. Uh, I mean, the title had me, you know, the, the moment that came out of Banning's mouth and said, there's this book out there. I'm like, well, I have to read that. Um, and, and you talk about it a bit in the book, but, you know, Ministry of the Future is established in response to kind of this extreme 
uh, climate moment that you kind of that you create in your in your storyline um, that made such a profound impression on the international community that they felt the need to to create this entirely new uh, organization that's charged with you, you know. Uh, uh, looking out for future generations, like looking out for people that don't have their own advocate, right? Future generations don't exist, so they can't advocate for their own future. And plants and animals, the biosphere certainly can't advocate for its own future. Um, and you had this great little term, uh, the circle of inclusion has been growing over historical time, right? Where somehow we've gotten to the point in human civilization that we realize in our decision making, we actually need to include um, future generations, even though they don't they can't cast a vote at the ballot box today, right? Um, so how did you see the oceans figuring into that equation, right? You talked about rivers, you talked about forests. You, there's all these net parts of the natural world that need advocacy if they're going to survive into the future. How did you think about about all that? Well, it I, I traced the evolution over historical time that has already existed and what we have got to now, which includes some emergent um, signals in terms of law. The Constitution of Ecuador has its forest as a citizen with rights. Uh, the Constitution of Wales, the Children's Trust and other organizations are defending the rights of children. Uh, even though they can't vote. And then there's uh, even an, uh, a network of organizations uh, that are somehow charged with defending the rights of the future people that is, already exists. They're fairly uh, embryonic, you might say. Uh, but in my novel, it was important to seize on them as examples of what could happen if we uh, took the uh, rights of future people as being equivalent to our own. And this does have to do with legal standing. In other words, you have to have standing before a court will take your case. And standing is really the first accomplishment of making a legal case in the first place. Uh, there's a great environmental text by a Christopher Stone called Do Trees Have Standing? which is a kind of a pun, but he meant, of course, legal standing. Right. And so this is an issue already. And, and to get to the specific in your question, um, the oceans then would be part of the biosphere. The oceans are a space for living creatures that humans depend on to stay alive. And the ocean has also taken up um, maybe 40% of the CO2 that we've burned into the atmosphere has ended up in the oceans and chemically changed the oceans so that the pH of the ocean itself is measurably different <clears throat> than it was when we started measuring. And when you consider how much water that is to change its pH by a measurable difference is a sign of how much uh, carbon we've poured into it as a basically a depositor of waste and pollution. So we've fouled the ocean and uh, we've also overfished it so that the ecology of the oceans between uh, physically warming it up because the temperature is higher at even at depth and changing its chemical composition with its pH and then overfishing it altogether, the oceans are at risk. And if, say, if, if the um, acidity, the increased acidity of the oceans uh, uh, kills off a certain kinds of um, microscopic life at the bottom of the food chain in the ocean, then everybody knows that the uh, food chains work, that if the bottom's gone, everything up it in the pyramid goes away. It's an elementary school type observation. Uh, if the life in the ocean crashes because we have changed the chemical composition such as the bottom goes out of the food chain there, then that's about one third of humanity's food right there. So um, we think of the oceans as um, impervious to us and uh, infinite in their productivity. A really good scientist, uh, Thomas Huxley, uh, Darwin's bulldog, said it's impossible to deplete the fish in the ocean. That would be like, you know, taking the stars out of the sky or something. Mm -hmm. It was an inability to imagine industrialization and population growth for even the smartest citizens of the time. Now we've got a lot more data and we're in a lot more dangerous situation. And Huxley, looking at the fishing technologies of his time, was effectively right. He didn't understand that the technologies could change so radically. Right. So now the oceans need protection and they have, there's of course, as you know, the international laws of the ocean, that's all good, uh, but there is no sheriff. 
So people break those laws and no one goes after them. There's no mechanism. So that's one of the things that my ministry for the future is designed to try to organize is a defense of what is currently is not defended. That gets it into scary territory of um, uh, means and um, uh, how, how d- does the what you might call the monopoly, the state monopoly on violence, can that be extended in uh, legal uh, ways? And if not, would it be extended by illegal ways to stop the illegal destruction of the oceans? So yeah. there's more to be said, but I'll leave that there. No, that's great. That's great. Um, you know, to part of the adventure of the book, I felt, was you never quite knew it was coming next, right? And I, I feel like you started that out with uh, a climate change event that, um, you know, I like how you characterize these things as kind of punctuated, or I guess mathematicians, we call it stochastic, right? Um, it's not a linear process. And I think when we talk about climate change and how much carbon the oceans have uh, absorbed, we see this really smooth curve and and we're lulled into thinking, oh, it's going to be a smooth future. It may get smoothly worse and worse, but at least it's smooth. But I think mm. your story did a great job of saying, no, you know, you will cross these boundaries and very bad punctuated things will happen and we need to be ready to deal with that. But in many ways, your, your story is a good news story, right? Um, you know, it's a story of what could happen if only we organized to kind of address the big issues of the day. And it makes me wonder kind of what are the big ocean catastrophes that you think were averted by kind of the good news story that you had, right? Um, uh, all yeah. sorts of things could have happened in your story and, and, and you chose not to go there, right? True. Um, and I like this um, uh, description that you made of the punctuation. Uh, it's like uh, Stephen Jay Gould's punctuated evolution that uh, things go along steadily for a while and then they're accumulating pressures to the point where there's a break and it is stochastic. Um, I talked with Ezra Klein about this, and he uh, described it as a situation of slow violence, um, systemic, where the privileged on this planet are committing slow violence against the, say, two billion poorest people on the planet who don't have the resources to fight back very well and are suffering already and immiserated, that when slow violence cracks into fast violence, that's the first scene in my novel, and they keep coming back like that. The eyewitness accounts, of which there are, I never counted how many, but maybe a few dozen eyewitness accounts in the novel, are very often at those moments of punctuation where slow violence that is systemic and you don't see it cracks into a fast violence, and that's what an eyewitness uh, uh, relates to the reader. So uh, one of those eyewitness accounts is um, from a fisherman, But see, there are um, boats out in the Southern Ocean that are pirate boats. Pirate fishing is happening right now. A lot of the fish that we eat is illegal and breaking the marine laws that are set up by international treaty. But there are certain nation states who are bad actors and don't enforce the international treaties that they themselves have signed to. Um, I I can name names, uh, uh, Japan, Russia, Spain, there are others. Uh, And those boats are out there on a permanent basis. They don't come into land because they're pirates. So they shift their fish onto um, transfer boats that then um, bring them into land looking more innocuous and more legal. And the poor fishermen out on that boat often spend their lives out there or the bulk of their lives as slaves. So in my novel, one of the eyewitnesses is one of these slave fishermen who... um, uh, sees someone come and effectively a, a counter pirate rescuing the, um, the the slaves off that boat and then simply sinking that boat with the uh, captain still on board. So these kinds of uh, punctuations of fast violence, in this case in resistance to the slow violence, um, I think are likely to happen because people are going to be desperate and angry and their sense that they are in a resistance So they won't be thinking of themselves as terrorists. They'll be thinking of themselves as freedom fighters and as resistors to a dominant order that is unjust. And that will happen on the ocean too. Uh, That's, uh, I love that, slow violence. It makes, 
every life choice I make every day puts it in real stark, stark relief. Uh, makes me need to think about myself a bit. Um, so I, I'd love to shift over to kind of the Arctic and the Antarctic because one of the big things you did in your book, right, is you kind of saved us from sea level rise. You saved, you know, all of co coastal civilization, which is frankly a large majority of our of our urban civilization, right, is coastal. You save us from all of that, and you do it through like major geoengineering projects that require, you know, massive nation state resources in order to pull it off. Um, can you talk about the inspiration for that, why you chose to make that part of your plot versus, frankly, the alternative? And, you know, if 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 the Arctic Council called you up and said, Stan, you know, what do we do? Um, you know, how close to the storyline would, would your recommendations be? What I would say is I'm really happy to talk about the Arctic and Antarctic. I, I've never been to the Arctic, but I've been twice to the Antarctic and I'm I love these areas. They are they strike me as landscapes and seascapes as extremely evocative and tr and attractive. And they are warming up faster than the rest of the planet, as we know. And they are uh, implicitly uh, they are deeply implicated. Let's put it that way in uh, rising sea levels. So as we heat the planet, heat the poles then um, we are going to be seeing sea level rise that will destroy our coastal civilizations. I wrote about that explicitly in my novel, New York 2140, where I postulated a, a quite rapid sea level rise that was truly 50 feet higher by the year 2140. This is uh, probably faster than it is likely to happen, but it's not completely impossible. And I was happy that a paper by James Hansen and, and 16 colleagues was published in 2016, right as I was writing my book, pointing out that in the past, we have seen a one degree centigrade Celsius um, global average temperature rise followed by a really rapid, like one century, 10 meter sea level rise. It was a controversial paper. It was sort of constructed by many different lines of evidence um, uh, uh, leaning against each other to make a case, like a kind of a almost a jigsaw puzzle case. And um, it was speculative in the best kind of way. Um, and it certainly helped me in that novel. In this novel, I wanted to talk about things that I had read about and been told about in person by glaciologists mm -hmm. who actually didn't want to publish their Antarctic plan because they didn't want to get involved in the geoengineering wars. That if you write about a geoengineering technique now as a scientist, your career is at that point a geoengineer's career with the rocks through the windows, with the character assassination by way of the internet. Um, you uh, join a war. Uh, it's a discursive battle usually, but it can be also a legal battle in getting sued or suing people for slander. And th this glaciologist in particular didn't want to get into that. He said, Stan, that's your job. You're the science fiction writer. So I was given a new idea to put into my book and spread it around. And of course I checked with my other glaciologist friends because my trips to the Antarctic have given me an entry into that very small world of glaciologists. And they said, well, maybe, um, and that was enough for me. So the idea is that, uh, which I'd explored earlier, that rising sea level, could we pump the water back up onto the Antarctic uh, ice cap, polar, the polar ice cap, let it freeze there, solve the problem. Well, it turns out to be something like 3,600 cubic kilometers of water for every meter rise or even centimeter rise of the ocean, which, you know, I'm not a quantitative person that blew my mind. I had not done the math. And I, what it, what it points out is just how big the ocean is. Um, it's, it's really big. And, you, and the Potsdam Institute did a study of this solution. So real scientists worked on it and said, well, you might be able to do it, but you would need more pipeline than we've ever produced in the whole history of humanity. And you would need 10 million windmills to create the clean energy to pump that much water. 
And that represents like 7% of all of the energy produced by humanity, electricity right now. So, okay, that's not gonna happen. I was really sad because um, for years, I, like since my novel, Green Earth, I had been thinking it would be a solution. It's not completely off the table to think about some of the dry playas of the um, this world as rehydrated salt seas. It's an old Jules Verne idea. The Salton Sea came from that. In other words, the pumping is not completely off the table, but it's not the solution. So this glaciologist said, the reason that we're getting these rising sea levels uh, is not that Antarctica melts from the top down, uh, it gets lubricated from the bottom. So what melt there is goes down moulons, these cracks in the ice down to the floor of the glaciers, lubricates the glaciers in their slide down into the sea. They're moving 10 times faster than they were when we first started measuring them. And that's because of the lubrication at the bottom. That, he calculated, was about 20 cubic kilometers of water. And we have the pumping technology all the time in Antarctica. We're drilling down, pumping out. Uh, we, we investigated Lake Vostok. We routinely shoot through the Ross Ice Shelf to check out the bottom. The technology exists. And he was suggesting that if you could go to the right places, and that is, by the way, the big if, could you find the right places and are there right places? suck the water out from the bottom, the glaciers thump back down onto their rock beds, slow back down to their historical speeds, which are one-tenth of the speed now, and we don't have sea level rise as fast as we would otherwise, and that problem somewhat gets taken off the table. It's, it's geoengineering, but in an odd way because it's localized, and it seems to have no uh, downside, no potential secondary effects that would create damage worse than what we're trying to solve. So it was so interesting. I had to make it a feature of the novel. For the Arctic, the Arctic is much more of a problem, although it's only Greenland melting that adds to um, sea level rise. And you can do the same procedures in Greenland as in Antarctica, and even better because those channels under those glaciers are much more canyon-like, and much more likely we can find possible spaces to uh, pump them out and thump them down. The Arctic Sea melting, the problem there isn't that it rises sea level because the ice is floating, of course, but that exposed open water takes in way more sunlight than an ice cap. The albedo of the planet gets changed massively and sunlight lances down into the Arctic Ocean, warms it up, and boom, we are cooked. Um, so there have been proposals. Again, they're not mine, but I do forget where I read them. I can confess that. That if the Arctic Ocean open in summer were stained yellow, uh, it would be an albedo almost like ice and the sunlight would bounce off of it and you would solve that particular problem and the stain would go away seasonally. It would be a temporary fix like sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, five years later, it would presumably have gone to the bottom or dissipated and then you'd either do it again or not. Um, that's so bizarre. And of course, messing with the oceans, there are some other geoengineering schemes like dumping um, iron filings in and creating algal blooms. This seems to me to be one of the more dangerous ideas for geoengineering to mess with our oceans when they're already damaged. I personally think none of them are um, looking very good, but this staining of the Arctic was at least interesting enough to throw into the novel as a kind of provocation. Like maybe we'll be doing weird things because we're desperate and we're in an all hands on deck situation where every good idea or even some bad ideas for mitigating climate change um, uh, to avoid going over a tipping point into complete disaster, we might be doing some weird stuff. And that the book is about that too. For sure. It, you know, it's interesting. I always often say, um, you know, we've been doing geoengineering for a really long time in this really hapless, clueless sort of way. We didn't know yes. we're doing it. Uh, yeah. But it's humanity's engineering interventions that have accelerated so much of this. And yeah. then there's the opposite, right, which is, um, uh, well, or, or maybe just steering the same human impulse in a different direction is rewilding. And, you know, rewilding is a major subplot in your book in a couple different places. 
Uh, you talk about E.O. Wilson's uh, Half Earth, um, his his book, and kind of the the little social movement that uh, has it, it has spawned. Um, uh, it was really focused on. Uh, uh, I would say the terrestrial earth. I mean, when I read it, you know, I didn't get much out of the ocean discussion there. Um, and your, your discussion really focuses on building these terrestrial habitat corridors. You have this Yukon to Yellowstone corridor that you envision being built and all the great things that come out of it. But you do also reference the regreening of the ocean shallows um, mm. as kind of a deliberate activity. Um, but when we look back hundreds of years, right, when the when the Vikings showed up to North America, right, the ocean shallows were extremely green and extremely fertile. So, you know, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about your ideas on the restoration and re rewilding opportunities that exist for the oceans and how those contribute to climate restoration and planetary health more broadly. Sure. Um, it will take me out into... Um, deep waters, as we might say, given the topic where I will drown, but I'll give it a shot. Um, I do like very much the E.O. Wilson Half Earth Plan. Humans are already congregating in cities. It would not have to be a forced uh, removal. It would just be a um, coordination of an already happening human phenomenon um, uh, up until the pandemic, people really like cities. And I think that um, that liking for cities might survive the even the pandemic when we get to whatever new dispensation that we're in. In any case, the wild creatures of this planet are in terrible trouble. We're in a uh, the start of a mass extinction event that is, to my mind, the worst part of the climate change emergency. Uh, if we give to the humans of um, four or five generations from now a planet that we have killed off the wild creatures in substantial numbers of species, that will be a crime that we they can't recover from and that we will always be tagged with. So um, I've heard that 97% of the meat on the terrestrial part of the planet is human beings and their domestic beasts, that the wild creatures are 3% of the biomass. Uh, and I'm think, I take it they're talking about animals here. In the oceans, I've heard that 80% of the fish that we're eating out of the oceans come from farms, fish farms, like aquaculture. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm surprised at that. But if it's true, it's an interesting indication. And then in the decarbonization project, to pull carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere uh, plants do that when they when they grow and so reforestation and regenerative agriculture are really big deals in this notion of natural uh, decarbonization and the oceans well uh, kelp beds and as you say the green coastlines in the shallows that's an enormous amount of biomass of carbon that could be sequestered. And of course it dies and, and rots and gets returned to the atmosphere, but that's a loop cycle. And when it's uh, captured, if there's growth of the greenery on the coastlines, then that brings down carbon out of the atmosphere. And since it's an all hands on deck situation, every uh, pr project that does this needs to be uh, paid for. It needs to be a way to make a living. And so therefore, um, it shouldn't be a penalty. It shouldn't be something we have to pay to do or suffer to do. It should be something that we're rewarded to do. So eventually we need to talk about finance. But to get to the oceans, I don't know, and I've never run across anybody uh, who makes a convincing case that they do know how easy it would be to do this. In other words, to farm uh, kelp from scratch, does that work? Um, have we tried it? I don't know, but I suppose there are people who do. And it, it, it's something that actually I learned about most since I finished Ministry for the Future. So it's not as big a strain in there as I might have made it if I'd known more. It's, it's funny. I, I, I'm not sure if it's a breach in protocol, but I give a plug for one of our other book talks coming forward is uh, Bren Smith just wrote a book called Eating Like a, Eat Like a Fish. And he's actually a... a a Northeast fisherman who has come up with exactly what you're talking about, how to have uh, small uh, hold farmers 
um, farm kelp and bivalves and, you know, all these things that make the earth, make the oceans better. And I'm not a fisherman either. Um, so, you know, but he seems to have a sense of what that can look like at scale. And like you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, kelp, you know, uh, the amount of carbon it can pull, carbon dioxide it can pull out of the oceans is enormous. Uh, and it's a uh, wide range of human uses are, are, we go well beyond food. So great promise there. But it's funny you mentioned economics. I mean, I feel like you got a PhD in economics somewhere along the way. Um, uh, given uh, all the writing you did, I, I, I get the sense, well, it's clear from your writing that you think uh, the finance community owns a lot of the blame, um, but also uh, holds a lot of the promise for uh, how we could turn things around. Um, and you kind of talk about, you know, Bretton Woods and the post-World War II financial agreements that we put in place that kind of drove this perpetual gr growth mentality. But I think you have some interesting ideas around economic policy mechanisms that might protect the well-being of the future of the oceans. Um, maybe you'd like to talk about those a little bit? Yes. And let me start by saying that it was indeed an article about this book, Eat Like a Fish, that I read like in February or March when my text was done. And I said, oh, my God, that's clearly a missing chapter um, you know, the book should be 107 chapters long or probably 120, but that was one of them that would be clearly wonderful to describe. And I was very excited. And again, it, it comes to the economics. Mm -hmm. um, to get started to scale, um, people need investment and they need subsidies. They need investment from government. They need these to be public projects so that um, the legality of them and the finance of them uh, gets them jump started and going fast. And they don't have to make a profit in a competitive market where the other forms of production are being subsidized and the future is being cheated so that um, in a systemic Ponzi scheme, someone trying to make an honest living can't. And that's where this guy with his um, aquaculture has um, an initial problem and finance needs to change. It's not the finance community. Let's keep it systemic and about systems. We've all agreed to by our votes and our political representation in general to these laws that govern our, our economy. The, the economy is a legal system and everybody is, um, complicit isn't right, the right word, but everybody is responsible to the extent that their political representation is real. We can talk about whether political representation has been stolen from us or, or but we've, we could also say, in the United States anyway, if you believe in democracy, that if you voted in the right politicians and they passed the right laws, we'd have a completely different system. Sure. And that would be done nonviolently and by a legal mechanism of changing the laws, which we do all the time. What the laws need to do is change the way that we pay for things and change the subsidies and change the taxes and uh, the law itself create a system in which doing good work of of sequestering carbon, of decarbonizing, and of, of producing needed stuff like food um, is rewarded so that you can make a good living um, uh, where you're not desperate, where you're not uh, borrowing or speculative or in debt to do it. Make a good living by doing the right thing rather than extracting value uh, and stealing it from future generations and getting rewarded with a profit for doing the wrong thing. So even metrics, economic metrics like profit, even economic words like efficiency need to be restudied from the axiomatic level of what are they really talking about? Efficiency is like most results for uh, least input and efficient always sounds like a virtue in economic talk in capitalist society. Machine guns are efficient. The gas chambers in Nazi Germany were efficient. So the goals of one's efficiency, of least input, most output, the goals are crucial. Right now, the goal is maximize profit, do it efficiently. That means wage pressure, which means scaring workers into 
taking any job they can. It means taking away their health care. It means ripping off them and the future generations. You create a profit. That's the metric. That's the goal. You're efficient in that goal, and you get the world we're in now. If the goal were different, if it were biosphere balance and um, justice among people, equality, if these were the goals, the efficiencies would look different. The measurement systems would be different. So it's at the level of goals that you need to push. We want these things and then shape the political economy to um, get those things rather than profit for the 1% by way of extraction of value from us and from future generations, from people and from the biosphere. So um, this is fundamental, but it's also, if we were to win the discursive battle, if a voting majority and a working majority in legislatures were on the same page about this story that I'm telling, we could get this done without revolution, without the invention of a new technology, without um, um, targeted violence to make it happen. It, I hold out hope that it could still be done by winning the discursive battle, spreading the story, getting the plans out there, the technologies already exist, and then making it the law of the land. And in and the finance community, Wall Street, if that were the uh, goal of society and if the laws were right, they would be finding ways to make money from that. Well, that could be seen as the usual parasitical kind of vampirism, or it could be seen as a way of generating more capital to throw into more good efforts. That would be depending on who in the financial community was doing what. It is a human business in the end, and people are making moral and financial choices. But however, um, um, everybody, if the people, even the people profiting through 2008, they were doing things that were ostensibly legal, and they were making money. So when there are legal things one can do to make money, that happens. People do it, because uh, that's the rules of the game we're playing. So we need to change those rules is what I'm saying. And that involves clarifying the larger situation and going right back down to the axioms of what is civilization trying to do. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, just talk about finance. I'd like to talk about time and how we conceive of time. Um, you know, in your story, you envision kind of a fundamental change in ocean shipping, reverting back to sailing. And I've seen pictures of these container ships with giant masts um, and you know they take a little longer to cross the ocean but you make the point that you know supply chains would adjust you know if it takes nine days to cross the ocean instead of two days supply chains would adjust commercial uh, consumer expectations would adjust and you you even switch kind of transoceanic uh, air flight which is a huge carbon contributor right um, to ship travel and you have some of your um, characters, you know, crossing the ocean in a ship. And it seems utterly delightful, right? I mean, it's a little bit blast from the past, but it's a different way of conceiving of the value of your time um, and trading away some of our time in favor of a more sustainable planet, right? So uh, once that transitions in effect, it doesn't really come off as that much of a sacrifice. I mean, in your story, you're like, oh my God, no airplanes, this is gonna be a disaster. And then you realize, you know, it could actually work out okay. Um, it's just a different formulation. So perhaps a more sustainable future involves taking more time to enjoy our oceans and other parts of nature. Like, how do you think about that? Well, thanks for that, because it has been really on my mind. Um, and the I love sailing ships inherently, and they were a good technology. And so uh, the fossil fuel moment, the, the carbon culture, the burning carbon and thinking that didn't matter, uh, once we've learned that that isn't true, that historical moment and structure of feeling and economic structure is all past. It turns out that uh, cruising around on the oceans at speed, burning diesel fuel is wrecking the planet at a uh, rate that means that it's not truly economical over the long haul. So it is a time function. And and indeed, if if the a ship took nine days to cross the ocean rather than two, but there were ten more ships and they were still arriving every day, 
nobody would notice the difference. And one, th a couple of things have happened. The pandemic has happened. Many people have started working from home and can work from home because of this device that we're on now. Um, that isn't true for all jobs, but for a lot of jobs, if you had to spend um, five days to get from here to Europe rather than uh, 12 hours stuck in a tin can, um, and you were out there on a sailing ship crossing the sea and still doing your job by way of the way we're doing our job now, where's the loss in that except that you've just had a sea voyage, um, which uh, people do for fun, for vacation, for a relief from being in tin cans. Um, the 12 hours a day and then sleeping in a tin can and then basically living your life in boxes. We live our lives in boxes and that's been, and we've been cocooned in oil, cocooned in crap and uh, stripping away some of that cocoon of necessity might have the unexpectedly positive side effect of uh, revealing us more to the world itself. Uh, like taking off layers of bad oily overcoats uh, because it's actually a warm day and you strip off all that crap and suddenly the wind's on your face and on your body and you're thinking, wow, why was I wearing all that crap in the first place? So the pandemic has taught us some things and I don't think these are lessons that are going to be forgotten, even though there's going to be a massive effort at repression, repression of the memory of this period. When we get the vaccines, there's going to be a, an intense effort to pretend that it never happened and that we'll go back to the old normal. But there's going to be a lot of people saying, no, I remember, you know, I had my kids that should have been in school in my face all day. I know things are different now. Um, and this is merely talking about the prosperous um, third of um, the developed world. For a lot of people, it means more like, no, I remember we were starving, our crops failed. Um, the immiserated two billion on the planet are at the sharp end of the stick, and they're not going to forget either. So I think we're going into a changed time that will change our sense of time, as you put it. Um, so it's no longer uh, microseconds in high frequency trading. It's more like, wait, I'm going to take a week. And to finish this, um, my wife and I, her family place, which we love and need to take care of, is on the coast of Maine. We live in California. So this year, in order to avoid airplanes and airports, we drove. Well, it was five days of continuous driving. It was a carbon burn. It was possibly even, I mean, I, I'm not positive on the math here, but I think it was considerably smaller carbon burn than flying would have been. And it was interesting in a way that I wouldn't have suspected. I thought, oh no, five days out of my life, I could those five days could have been spent on our place in Maine, blah, 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 blah. And then we did it. And I was thinking, well, this is weird. The country, the, con the country's big. The continent is weird. Um, the differences between the West Coast and the East Coast, just in landscape terms, in geographical terms, to speak to your people, um, is fascinating in a way that flyover doesn't show you. Right. The flyover doesn't give you the scale. It doesn't give you the textures. So the same will be true on the oceans. Um, and I've never even done it. But by God, before I die, I'm going to sail across an ocean as a passenger, watch the sails. And, and to finish, though, there's a Swedish company. There's others working on this giant container ships mm -hmm. with new high-tech sails. The sail and the mast are the same. And they are controlled with the help of an AI. And sometimes there's even talk of throwing a kite up into the jet stream and getting pulled along a little extra. Right. Uh, world traffic, I postulate, would begin to trend in the same way as the prevailing winds. Right. Always true in the past, but the trade winds were always a huge advantage. If you wanted to go west, you would find the trades. So um, if this comes back, there's actually a lot of good in it. There's, it's a positive outcome from a bad situation that we're in now. It's a solution that is not wearing a hair shirt or going without, or suffering. Because I think a lot of young people in particular are thinking, God damn it, you know, they had it great in the 1960s, cocooned in oil, and it wasn't that great. And living uh, more exposed to the world with these new solutions is a more sophisticated technologies. It's more stylish, it's, it's more alive. And that's something I think the young people can seize on and create and think, no, this is actually the best generation yet. It's not a reduction of standard of living, not at all. 
No, I, I love that. Um, so kind of my last question, and then I will uh, uh, cede the floor to you. Um, through the lens of your imagined future, what would you tell future generations to dwell on and take action on regarding the future oceans? Um, the the half-Earth um, philosophy ought to be applied to the ocean as well. There ought to be huge, huge parks set by boundary, surveilled by satellite, that are simply never visited by human ships. And that doesn't completely solve the problem by any means, because the systemic issues uh, flow through the oceans everywhere. Um, so, and nevertheless, for the life in the oceans, um, it being so fecund and um, re, um, lively, so healthy when it is healthy, if we were to leave, and you could leave two thirds of the oceans free and still do all of the things that humans need to do in the ocean and, and allow the ocean to replenish itself, quit exploiting the oceans the way we have been. And if that needs to involve drones from space or drones from high altitude finding pirates and sinking pirates, then I'm going to say the law is the law. If people are breaking the law, then boom, they need to be captured or disabled. And, and brought to justice. You could maybe um, zap all of the electricity on their ship and then they're drifting and then you pick them up and, uh, and jail them. There, in other words, we need a sheriff to enforce this. It needs to be the law and we can't be squeamish about dealing with pirates. We never have been in the past. And um, the state monopoly on violence exists for a reason. It's bad, it's scary, it can be abused. It's better than any other else um, dispensation of violence that we have. And in the absence of some kind of pacifist uh, super civilization, which I hope comes as soon as possible, we need to be um, scrupulous but uh, bold in enforcing the laws. Because right now piracy is running rampant. And so that's what I'd say to the people of the future is um, – Go ahead and and keep humans off huge stretches, uh, important stretches. It will be possible for oceanographers to say this is an area that should uh, have protection. It will help everybody else, right. and to to make those marine parks and also to enforce the marine parks. So I mean, this is a little bit, uh, I suppose, utilitarian and and a tough. You know, it's a tough topic to get into, but that's what I would say. Well, wonderful, uh, Stan. Out of respect for your time, uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. Any any parting comment you want to make before I tell everyone uh, who's watching this to make sure to buy the Ministry of the Future and read it now? Well, I'd like to say thanks, and also the American uh, Geographical Society. I, geography is, you know, it's every kid's dream. It's the globe spinning in your uh, – I had a globe that lit up like a lamp from within. I, it's still by my bed. I've had it since I was – seven. And so its political map is from, you know, 1960, pretty cool. And it's a little faded, um, but it still works. And I love it. And everybody should love it. These, it's more than maps. It's the world that what I love about geography and that whole related set of sciences and humanities, the combination of science and humanities that represents geography, because it's really nature plus culture it's about humans in our on our on our earth and how do they deal with the biosphere that's that's a crux issue so you're right at the crux and doing the the good work the exciting work and uh, a final story um i on our drive back home from maine just recently we stopped by niagara falls which i had never seen before it was only a half hour off our route and there it was one great lake falling into another great lake it was astonishing. I had never seen so much water. It was a wonder of the world. And there were thousands of people there, most of them masked, in order to take a look at, at the world. So I fear that internet reality has seized the brains of the young and that the real world out there has lost its interest. But, you know, I go up to the Sierras and young people are using their iPhone to map these astonishing feats of strength and skill. I go to Niagara Falls and see something that is just like, I mean, the watershed that is gathering that 
if you think about the size, it makes sense that it's that much water. Um, the real world is the ultimate high pixel adventure. And it's also our extended body. It's important. So you guys are, are right. Put your finger right on the crux. It's you found uh, work. It can actually be your work can be your play, as my grandfather told me, or your play can become your work. And it's also very important. So um, congratulations. I mean, <laughs> you you certainly have found the right uh, uh, way to uh, spend a productive and, and fun life and I'm I'm filled with admiration uh, and uh, and really happy to be included in the community. Well, uh, that's inspiring, uh, inspiring words, and we uh, appreciate the sentiment. Uh, thank you very much. We may just uh, excerpt that and play that on a loop on the internet forever on why people should care about geography. My so, pleasure. I would uh, be so happy to be part of it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And to uh, everyone who's tuned in today, I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank uh, Kim Stanley Robinson for joining us for nearly an hour discussing his new book, The Ministry of the Future. Please make sure to click on it today and buy the book. Uh, it's a great Christmas present for all your friends and family. And uh, we uh, look forward to having you tune in to our next talk um, uh, uh, later today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stan. And uh, we'll uh, see you in the future. Right home. Thanks, everybody. My pleasure.